Iraq has failed to attract foreign investment from oil majors. At an auction for oil and gas contracts, the oil ministry offered seven new blocks in border areas with Iran, three near Kuwait and one in offshore Gulf waters. Iraq-owned and UAE-based Crescent Petroleum won contracts for the Jilbat al-Qumar, Khashm Amr Injana and Khadr al-Mai block. China's Geojade grabbed the Hueza and Naft Khana block. The Sinbad block was awarded to China's United Energy. Five other blocks failed to attract any interest. Oil giants Total, Exxon and Gazprom initially expressed interest but dropped out without giving reason. And Italy's INI made one unsuccessful bid. The oil ministry unexpectedly moved the auction date from late June to April. A decision that many consider was politically motivated, given national elections are set to take place on May 12. And oil minister Jaber al Loebi is campaigning for a seat in parliament. And for more on this, our editor-at-large, Craig Peters, joins us from Paris and in Dubai is Robin Mills. He's the CEO of consultancy firm Camar Energy. And Robin, uh, I want to start with you, if I may. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the specific region that these blocks are in. Um, how much crude is in there? How much might it be worth? So these are expiration blocks so-called, and they're, as I think as your report said, seven of them along the, the border with Iran uh, and, uh, and and then three along the border with Kuwait and one in, in the offshore. So some of them have discoveries on previously. Oil or gas has been found there, not yet developed, uh, and there's more work required to prove up how much crude there is. So some of these blocks, we're probably looking at a, a, perhaps a few hundred million barrels of crude established which is not giant by Iraqi standards. But really, I think the companies are hoping to, to appraise these fields, discover that they're rather larger than expected, and also draw up new structures which might uh, hold larger fields. Right. Tell us a little bit about the mechanics of how the Iraqi government remunerates oil companies. Uh, it's linked to the prevailing oil price, uh, but also the amount by which they would raise output. Is that right? Well, so for the first uh, fields that were given, away so far from 2009 onwards, which the, the big companies such as Shell and Exxon have been working on subsequently, uh, companies there were paid a fee per barrel. So for every barrel they produced, they'd be paid $1, $2, whatever the number was that they'd bid. Now, this auction is on a different basis and has moved much closer to international standards. And I think that's, uh, that has, uh, has made it a more interesting scheme for, for companies. So now companies will be paid uh, a percentage share of the revenues which is much more typical worldwide. So as oil price goes up, so does the company's share of production. Right. Um, so why has there been so little interest? Well, really, I think because this auction was held at quite late notice. The Iraqi elections are coming up uh, a, a little later in May. The oil ministry wanted to get this auction away before the, uh, before the election so they could have some success to show uh, before there's a, a new government being formed. And so it was quite rushed. Uh, the contract terms had some some negative features that, that, that deterred some companies, but a lot of companies complained that simply they didn't really have time to evaluate the blocks and evaluate the contracts fully to be able to bid in this. Um, and there was, as I said, there were some issues with the contract that put companies off, uh, and that's I think really why you saw companies like uh, Total and Exxon Mobil choosing not to bid uh, and not to take part in this, and why it's it's really smaller companies who have emerged as the winners. Yeah, um, Craig, let me turn to you for a second. Um, <coughs> Iraq seems to be in something of a catch-22. It needs foreign investment uh, to build up its oil sector, but because of the security mm. situation and other things, uh, it's finding it hard to do so, and the less money it has, the more that that situation gets worse. Is that a fair assessment? Well, it's a fair assessment, and it's an assessment that Iran can take really good control of. Look, Iraq is now OPEC's second largest producer. Now, without putting too fine a point on it, uh, uh, Iraq is now pretty much in a commonwealth with Iran. And Iran has the capability to either shut down or vastly curtail uh, Iraqi oil production. And there's a history here. Once upon a time, 
Iraq was also the world's second largest producer of dates. And I checked with the good folks at the International Nut and Dried Fruit Council, which is the OPEC of international nuts and dried fruits. Okay. And they told me that what happened was the, the Iraq— uh, Now, this is actually significant, as, as, as it is a little bit, uh, you know, pithy. Uh, the Iraq, Iraq's date production was wiped out during various wars. And when the Iranians came back in with their money to invest in the country, they invested in everything but date production. And, and the Iranians then started smuggling Iranian dates into Iran, which they package and sell abroad. The Iranians have a history of doing this. They did it with oil between 2011 and 2013, when Iranian tankers went into the port of Sudan, Port Sudan, the oil was rebaptized as South Sudanese oil, even though South Sudan wasn't doing any oil at the time. And uh, the president uh, down there, uh, Al Bashir, I believe his name was, yep. was making close to twelve dollars a barrel off of this. Right. So, so there's there's uh, some real reason to be concerned here. Okay, Robin, l let me bring it back to you. Uh, Craig's talking about the relationship with Iran in all of this. Uh, Iraq must be keenly watching what's happening with, between Iran and the U.S. Um, if the U.S. reimposes sanctions, let's say, on Iran, how does that affect Iraq's oil sector? <coughs> well, Iraq, Iraq, of course, and other major oil producers, if, if sanctions on Iran are reimposed, if they cut Iranian exports uh, significantly and the prices go up, other oil exporters will look to jump into that. Now, at the moment, they're constrained by this OPEC deal. Deal. So Iraq's production, along with others, is restricted, even though Iraq has been overproducing to an extent. If the sanctions are reimposed, all prices go up. We'll have to see what happens to the OPEC deal. But I think you'd have to feel, if a lot of Iranian oil is taken off the market, that OPEC will have to relax its deal to avoid a damaging spike in prices. Iraq, Saudi and others will, will take that chance to increase their own production. And so, uh, Robin, do you see the end of this deal if oil prices keep on rising the way they are over the next 12 months, let's say? I think if oil prices keep rising, let's say, kind of normally, I mean, uh, not in response to a, a big interruption in, in Iran or somewhere else, uh, the strong signals we're getting from the last OPEC meeting is that the deal will continue, even though prices you know, have been going up. Um, OPEC might, uh, might feel they're going up beyond what it expected, but we'll be happy to take the extra revenues. But if oh. there's a big emergency, Iran or Venezuela or something else, mm -hmm. I think OPEC will have to think differently. OK, we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Robin Mills, Kamar Energy and Craig Abitas in Paris. Thank you both very much.